Welcome. Uh, I'm Joseph Bradley. Uh, I have what I believe to be the best job in the world. I get to talk about what I think is probably the most exciting uh, change that we've been through uh, in, in well over a decade, and that is what we call the Internet of Everything, right? This great movement of digitization. And it being New Year's, right? It's so New Year's 2015. I told myself, man, my New Year's resolution from 2015 is I have decided in this connected world I'm going to be a millennial. <laughs> right? right. Why, why is that, that funny? Why are you guys laughing? I am going to be a millennial. Okay, so how many of you would like to join me in my New Year's resolution and be a millennial in 2015? All right, that's great. That's awesome. All right, keep your hands up. So there's a couple things I've learned now. Okay, so, yes, that's younger, man. I mean, you're 18 to 34, man. You're a millennial, right? All right. Okay, there's a couple things now to be a millennial. There's a couple things. So I'll just ask you two questions. First question is, is how many of you would be willing to give up your sense of smell rather than lose your internet connection? Okay, those are, okay, you, that's millennial test number one, right? 40% said that's what they would do. 40% said I will lose my sense of smell before I give up my internet connection. Okay, here's, here's the one final test, another test they have uh, for millennials. Okay, how many of you would be willing, we got a room right outside here, we can do it for you, to actually put an implant in your brain to give you direct access to the internet? Texting, so you know, beautiful, you guys are in, you guys are in, right? So 30% of millennials said, yeah, they'll do it. Yes, they'll do it, right? Yes, they'll do it. So that's the world that we're living in, right? We're living in a world where we're breaking down all of these shopping behaviors, right? All these consumer paradigms and attitudes. The idea of describing Joseph Bradley as a millennial between the ages of 18 and 22 <clears throat> is a very, very different individual based on what context or what is happening in my environment. I have the same recurring nightmare every time I fly a lot. Get on a plane, I fly a lot, right? I reach down in my bag and I realize, oh no, I don't have my Bose headsets. Why is that scary? Because wherever I go on the plane, there's this lovely family, lovely family, with three lovely kids but they're happen to be having a bad day. And those three kids are screaming, they're yelling, right? And at that moment, what do I want? I want a pair of headphones. So I'm running through looking for a pair of headphones. I don't want ads around discounts, <laughs> right? What do I want? I want a clear path to get there as quickly as I possibly can, right? Let you slide your, uh, going a little fast on this here. <laughs> they have a mind of their own. Um, that's what I want, right? But that Joseph Bradley is very different. That same individual looking for a pair of headphones is very different than if I were on the weekend going into my favorite retailer, browsing around for a set of headphones. Historically in marketing, that's the same person. African American, same age group, two different individuals. Very different based on the context which I'm going into, right? All of you have had that dreaded, if there's men in the, if there's fathers in the audience with daughters, you've all got that dreaded same request at some point in your life. Dad, I need you to go get me some shampoo. Oh, my God. Uh, wow. Okay. Right? How do you make those choices? How do you make those decisions? We are living in a world which is no longer static. It is so dynamic. So you got to break down these old paradigms. So this is what we try to understand. This is the answer, the question that we wanted to understand. How is it in this, in this today's market, do we actually understand the digital consumer? How do we take advantage and create value from the digital consumer? We did it in three primary ways. First way, right? We did a global study of over 10 countries. Today we're releasing the US and UK results, right? Approximately 600 uh, consumers in each of those uh, countries, blind survey, right? We understood and wanted to understand their experiences. Second, we did in-depth interviews with key industry thought 
leaders, right? Key industry thought leaders, one-on-one -on -one conversations to make sure we really understood what is happening in that marketplace. And then finally, we've done well over 200 customer engagements globally across the world with many of the leading retailers. And we wanted to be able to understand how have they actually implemented these solutions and what has been the return, the financial value. So not only can we test concepts, not only can we test concepts, but we have the ability to be able ultimately to understand what is the value associated with, the, with, with these things that we're looking at. Okay, so today we are experiencing a third reality in presentation skills, right? <laughs> the, the slide where it's on its own reality, but we will continue to try to bring it back to this, to this version of the, of, of the world. Okay, so the first thing that we notice, right, first thing that we notice from the research is, wow, market segmentation, the lifespan of the consumer, is really headed towards zero. They're changing so rapidly, so fast, right? It used to be what we, we, we described, we had this segment called Uber Digitals, those people that use mobile and applications while they were in the store, right? If you think about that today, who does that describe? Everyone, everyone, right? 55% in the US use retail specific apps, or 53% in the UK, one out of two, not only are they using retail specific apps, but they're also using independent shopping apps, your favorite, while they're in the store, right? What you are seeing is, it is no longer a matter of age. It is no longer a matter of social status, education, location. Everyone is connected, right? Everyone is connected. Okay, three top insights that I wanna to cover to you today from the research that we really learned. One, change isn't constant, it's instant. Change isn't constant, it's instant. So think about that, what does that mean when you're trying to build static processes and static market segmentation? We'll talk about that. Second, personalization is good. Nothing wrong with personalization, right? Love it, go into your favorite store, they check out, they say, hi, Joseph. I go, hi, right? That's great, makes you feel good. But that doesn't tell you about me, right? It's not sufficient. It's good, but it's not sufficient. So knowing my name doesn't tell you you know anything about me. And finally, finally, you have to win. You have to win the trust battle. Okay, let's talk about changes in constant. We are moving from a set of experiences that are no longer static, but they're dynamic. Think about that example I told you earlier on with Joseph Bradley looking for a pair of headphones, right? That same customer, that same individual, depending on my environment, the context, the location, the weather, what's happening in my life, I have different expectations. So trying to build an experience that does not adapt to me, right? doesn't win at the end of the day. So, what are some of the things that are contributing to that? Look at what's happening. Social, 95% of US uh, retailers have some type of Facebook page. Look at mobility commerce, grew 47%. Big data, right? Every retailer is talking about big data. 88% perceive significant growth in this area. Think about apps. If it doesn't work on mobile, it doesn't work. Right? If it doesn't work on mobile, it doesn't work. 64% of US shoppers are using mobile applications. When you think about social, mobile, apps, big data, what is that doing? It's fundamentally changing the shopping journey. Man, it used to be really simple. All those wonderful days, right? Man, I wanted to find something. I go in the store, do my product research. I go to someone in, in the store to check out. I pick it up in the store, and if I got some support, got a question, I go to the store. Nice and simple. Then came this buzzword called e-commerce and omni-channel. Oh boy, that became fun, right? Now what happens? Well, wait a minute. Now I can browse it in the store, 
I can pick it up in the store, outside the store. Maybe I get home delivery. I could pay PC payment. I could pay it online. Wow. Now I went from three journeys to 40 journeys. Now we're going from 13 billion connected devices a day to 50 billion in the next five years by 2020. And look at the journeys. Over 800 possible journeys. What is different? What is the key? The key is when you think about this term called Internet of Things, and we'll talk about that, IoT, what IoT is doing, it's instrumenting the experience. It's allowing us to see and track and understand how you're actually interacting, right? So that we can build dynamic processes to be able to handle certain circumstances as you go throughout the store, right? Dynamically. Let's give an example. What do we mean by a dynamic process? Wow. Let's say, for example, I'm entering a store and I'm in a rush. How does a store know I'm in a rush? How do you know I'm in a rush? Well, maybe my cart is tagged and maybe I'm moving at a rate that's 20% faster than everyone else in the store. Is, there, is that the right time now to send me some discount coupon ads, do you think? Do you think I wanna, do you think you wanna do that to me? No, what is it? But it'd be great if you gave me a virtual reality map and told me, hey, Joseph, you know what? Clearly, we know you're a new father. Guess what? You're a Russian in the baby aisle and you have no idea where you're going. Let's help you out, right? Let's help you out. Okay. Knowing my name doesn't mean you know me. Context is king. Context, right? Context. Everything in this world is about context. Personalization is very important. Personalization, you can think of it as when a retailer knows your name. Very, very relevant, very important. But when we ask consumers, what is that next level of improvement? What is that area where you say, you know what? I really wish they could do some more advancement in, right? Personalization was listed last, only about 18%. Doesn't mean it's not important, but what do, they, what do they want you to do more? They want you to help me more with my purchasing experience, where I'm purchasing, where is it located in the store, context, right? They want me to understand the, my total shopping experience based on location, speed, environment, length of stay, context. That's what's so critical, right? Okay, how do you get context, right? If you think about the world that we're moving in today, it used to be, man, the older data was, the more valuable it was, right? You store it all up. Take all this data, I store it all up, I can mine it for years and years and years and years. Very true. Still true today, some aspects. But where is the incremental growth? Incremental value is found in our ability to move decision making closer to the customer so that we can impact that moment of truth. In other words, how do I do analytics? How do I bring context at the point where that customer most needs it when they're making their buying decision? Real-time analytics. We call it moving analytics to the edge, or just simply put, closer to the customer. Several initiatives that we talked about in the survey, in the survey that we went through, whether we're talking about smart store operational analytics or targeting offers, right, based on what's happening in, in, in the environment where you are, right? If you ever give them a honey to-do list that involves fixing a fence, that happens to me every year. Every year, man, I gotta fix a fence, right? Every year. Go in the Home Depot. You're gonna get, you, get, you go in and you get some screws. They know it's the rainy part of the season, and they know Joseph has tried to fix his fence before, so what have I done to those screws? I've stripped them, because you're trying to get them out, right? Wouldn't it be great, wouldn't it be great if they said, ah, we know you're going here, you're buying these, these screws, it's rainy weather, you know, you, we know there's a high probability that you, these screws may be stripped, here are some applications to help you get the screw out rather than you going all the way back home and figuring out, oh boy, now I'm in trouble, right? Those are the types of things that we're talking about doing when we talk about contextualizing. And then checkout optimization. 
right? Checkout optimization is always a great one, right? I have a son who plays uh, football. He's a little bit bigger than dad, a um, little bit bigger than dad. Uh, me and my wife go to the store. Uh, we have a, uh, a, a basket. Um, he has two carts. Our, our basket is fruit. His is beef, cows, uh, and, and protein, right, protein. Um, I love it. And, and, and this is one pet peeve I have, and I talk to the retail, retail store manager all the time. I have about $1,200 in my grocery cart. Easy. And he's shaving now. High margin stuff, right? He's shaving. What line do I get to go to? I get to go. I get to go to the self-checkout line. That long line is waiting around the store. I'm in the back aisle. That's where I get to go. Right? Oh, and it gets better. It gets better. For my $1,200, I get to be further rewarded. I get to bag my own stuff. Now, what about the guy that buys a bag of chips? One item. What line does he get to go to? Express! He gets to go to Express Line. Right? He gets to go to Express Line. Making light of it. But these are issues that are very, very important to retailers, right? Very, very important. Okay. What we see is how do you make these processes dynamic? How are you able to fully understand and contextualize what's happening? There's three core capabilities a retailer has to have. Hyper aware. This is where the notion of IoT comes in, where you're talking about connected cameras, devices, things that allow you to connect, right? Then you have to build the ability to be predictive, meaning real time is in real time. I need to understand what is going to happen. So now I got to apply analytics to that. But oh, by the way, it has to be agile. If this, then that. I have to build those processes in order to create value. Okay. Several leading examples of hyper relevance, right? Several leading examples. Um, whether you're talking about savings, Key number one area that shoppers want, right? Savings. I bought a Shopular. One of the things I, I like about these, you're a big box retailer, you need to be very careful about what is your control point. I, remember I told you, if it doesn't work on mobile, it doesn't work. I signed up for uh, Shopular. I love the message I got. It said, Joseph, I'm Sherry. I go home. Oh, hi, Sherry. She says, Sherry says, Joseph, I'm responsible for your shopper happiness. Think about that. She didn't say the store was. She said, I am responsible for your shopper happiness. Don't worry about what store you're going to. Come to me. Very interesting, right? Very interesting. Think about efficiency. Man, it is about getting it to the right person, right place, right time. Same day delivery. We're talking about Google Express or Amazon Prime Now. How many of you have pets, pet owners? Oh man, you can relate to this, right? You're getting ready to go on a trip and you realize what? You're out of dog food or you're out of food. Let me tell you, two hour or two day delivery at that point is too late, right? You will pay for that one hour delivery, right? This, this is the type of contextual things that we're talking about. And then if you think about engagement, engagement, the Dandy Lab, great Kickstarter project, uh, it's the first store that doesn't um, necessarily talk at you, it talks with you, right? It doesn't just throw stuff at you. It allows you to interact with the products and the services that are there, a great one for you to check out, and several others. Okay, so during this, during this survey, we tested several concepts. Whether we talked about augmented reality, huge concept, right, in-store, helping you locate shopping lists in a store or providing you with different views or in-store advertising. We talked about digital signage, recommending products, checkout optimizer. We tested a variety of things, but the core to get out of this is, is prior to the study, we all knew savings was really important, the primary thing for consumers. But what we're finding is, man, efficiency is a very close second. It's savings, efficiency, and then engagement. That's really where, where, where things are happening. So let's give you a sense of this, right? So on the efficiency side, high demand for these three, right? They want checkout optimization, the ability to reduce 
time waiting in line, right? In-store guidance through augmented reality, helping me see visually where things are in the store, right? Savings, right? They would 78% would like to view digital signage with special promotions, right? Special offers via augmented reality again on the smartphone. And then finally, engagement, right? Interested in receiving information in general, right? Augmented reality is a strong concept that came across loud and uh, very, very loud and clear. Okay, so we've talked to you about the fact that change is constant, right? All the time, happening instantly, every time, which means that we gotta have dynamic processes, right? Means that it's not just about knowing my name, you gotta go beyond personalization. You gotta be relevant. Well, how do you do that? So we, we got the first two acres, but how do I do it? How do I do it is I gotta win the trust battle. Oh boy. I gotta win the trust battle, right? Okay, here's what they said about winning the trust battle. There's some basic information, there's a price of admission, as I like to call it, for playing in contextual aware. They're gonna give you their basic information, their name, their age, right? I told you I'm millennial, I'm openly giving that to you. Purchasing history, my likes and dislikes, I'm gonna give that to you. One thing to remember, very simple equation. Privacy is directly proportional to the value one receives. Directly proportional, right? Okay, so if we talked about savings, efficiency, engagement, if you show that, if you give me that, I'm willing to give you a little bit more, right? I'll talk to you about information from connected products that I'm using. I'll tell, I'm, I'm okay with you looking at some purchasing history from other retailers and letting you know my location. I'll give you a little more of that, okay. There's some clear no's though, right? Friends and family, man, that's out. Remember the old MCI, friend and family plan? <clears throat> right? Friends and family's out. Financial information, out. Right? Important to remember, though, do you think these will stay the same? Remember I told you, it's directly proportional to the value received. Over time, I expect this green line to actually start sliding down. Why do I say that? Today, how many of you Love to go to restaurants. New York, beautiful. Shame on you. You don't care about your privacy. You give your credit card to somebody you don't know. They go around some bin, they charge what you hope to be your bill, and you sign it. Why do you do that? Value you see, right? How many of you go grocery shopping? Privacy. You don't care about your privacy. Why do I say that? You put whatever you buy on a what? Nice conveyor belt. Everybody sees what you're buying, right? Everybody sees it. Why do you do that? Benefit received, right? Convenience, right? So if you can articulate the benefit to the consumer, if you can articulate the benefit to the consumer, more and more they will give you the right to play. But there is a price of admission, right? You gotta articulate that benefit, very, very important. Okay, let's get real specific. We tested several of these concepts. So how do I think about efficiency? How do I think about savings? How do I think about engagement? I mentioned a term early on called Internet of Things, the idea of connecting things. Here's what I want to leave you with, something very, very important. It's if you are a retailer and you're trying to be, think about how do I deliver a contextual experience, right? We've thought about this and there is a very specific actionable framework that you should be thinking through, okay? And it goes beyond Internet of Things to what we call Internet of Everything. So let me give you an example. First thing you want to think about is what it is the process that I'm trying to solve. So let's say checkout optimization, okay? First question you're going to ask yourself is, in any of these, what is the dark asset? What is that thing that I'm trying to connect in that process? It's IoT, the thing. What is the dark asset that I'm trying to light up, okay? Maybe that could be a parking lot. People move into a parking lot before they shop, great. Maybe it's a shopping cart. Parking lot tells me what? In order for that connected parking lot to give me information, I have to do what? Second thing, be able to take unstructured data and make it structured. So I have to be able to capture the data. So thing, IoT, right? No value created yet. I just connected a parking lot, no value created yet. Second, I gotta take that unstructured data and make it structured, right? Make it usable. 
Okay? So now I got things and data. Have I created value yet? No. What do I got to do next? I got to apply analytics to that data so that it can now impact process. Ah, now by applying analytics to that structured data, I know 40 minutes in advance when you are going to check out. I've connected the parking lot, I know you're about to enter store, and I'm following your shopping cart as it goes around the paths, so I know 40 minutes in advance when you are going to check out. So now I've got the thing, I got data, and I got process. Have I created value yet? No. Big data is nothing without big judgment. In other words, if I present you with information and you do the exact same thing you did before I presented you with the information, how much is it worth? Nothing. So all I've given you is some nice, gee whiz, good stuff. Right? So most retailers, you got people looking behind the lines and they're saying, yep, okay, 40 minutes and line is getting long. Yep. Yep. Okay, great. Haven't changed anything. So what's the last piece that I got to do? I got to tie it to people. Right? People, process, data, and things. That's the internet of everything. I tie it to people through what? Application. Remember? Doesn't work on mobile, doesn't work. So now I have an application that allows someone to know, hey, lines are getting long. You're stocking in the back of the store. It notifies you on your mobile device of choice to come up and open up a check register. Now I've completed the full experience. That is true with all of those, any one of those cases. When you're trying to figure out where do you start, what is a dark asset, what is a thing you want to connect, how are you going to capture data from it, how do I apply analytics to that data, change process, and finally, how do I tie it to people? Okay, when we looked at this across a variety of retailers and economic analysis, right, we found key areas of value, top four, process of selecting and purchasing goods, quality of interactions provided by the store associate, the physical environment in the stores, and the level of personalization, right? Those are the core areas that generate the greatest value, right, the greatest value. When you think about this for an average retailer, uh, in this case, a $20 billion retailer in revenue, 7% EBITDA margin, 900 stores, 120,000 plus employees, 113 million square feet. It's a, pretty significant value creation, 15.6% on EBITDA gains, right? Very, very, very significant. Just on those list of solutions that we've gone through there in the primary research that we've done. So we could do this for any retailer around the world. We've taken well over 200 plus independent solutions and be able to analyze and understand how does that impact you. The key is, the key is, the reason, why couldn't you do this before? Before, you didn't understand and didn't have the tools to instrument the process. Now we understand what you're looking at, how long you're looking at it. We understand context, right? That's the key value. Okay, so five things I'll leave you with. First, congratulations on your 2015 becoming a millennial. Welcome, right, welcome. Forget everything you thought you knew about digital consumer. Forget about it, right? My number one source my listening infrastructure, my number one source for retail apps happens to be my 69-year-old father who is retired. Sends me at least one or two cool apps he's found on, the, on somewhere every other day, right? Forget what you do. Focus on dynamic, not static experiences that deliver hyper-relevance, right? It's the notion of if this, then that. You have to build dynamism into your process, right? Have to have the ability for that process to adjust based on the information that that consumer is presenting to you. Man, all the money is at the moment of truth, so you gotta go to the edge. You gotta get your hands dirty, right? You gotta get your hands dirty, right? You, got, you, you gotta get closer to that customer, right? You gotta do analytics right there at the edge at the moment that they're making that purchasing decision, right? Getting a report three months later telling you that, oh wow, you know what? Man, do you realize that when most men come in to fix their fences. They strip their screws already. It'd be really great for us to have some different application there. Too late. You got to know it right then and there, right? The infrastructure that we're talking about. Yes, infrastructure. You do need an infrastructure that's capable of being able to what? To instrument the experience. Mobile clearly is important. Data is important. 
right? Data at the edge, big data analytics. That architecture is extremely important. So is your culture. So is your culture. Here's a quote. Culture eats strategy for lunch every day. <laughs> right? If your culture is not one that is set up to make decisions based on real-time data and analytics, you can make all this investment or not. So there is a significant amount of culture change that has to happen. And finally, finally, which gets me excited all the time, wow, technology is great. I'm Cisco, of course I love technology, right? But you need to think about the new business models that will be and can be enabled, right? It's the Airbnbs, right? It's the Ubers of the world. It's those notions of business models. How can I reshape value in the eyes of the consumer, right? So if I were to leave you with one thing, I will tell you this. In 2015, don't worry about what you don't know. Don't worry about what you don't know. There's going to be a bunch of uncertainties. That, that, that's, that's not where the breakthroughs are going to come in, right? There's a great book called Stall Points. 50, they asked all these CEOs in the last 50 years why they, why they failed, and they all talked about they worried about what they didn't know. That's not what you need to do. Instead, you need to think about and challenge what you believe to be true. That's where the value is, right? Break down those barriers. Hope you enjoyed the session and have a great show. Thank you very much.